I met Norman in about 1989 when I was writing for the first Foster volumes, which he was doing with Otto Leica. Martin Polly was the editor. And I went to interview Norman in Great Portland Street. And I wrote about um, the housing they did at Milton Keynes, Bean Hill, which was, um, everybody was very nervous about because it was a bit of a disaster, frankly. Um, and Norman was kind of humming and ahhing about whether to put it in the book at all. And I wrote this piece about it, which turned the kind of triumph into, to disaster into triumph in a sense, because it showed how the architects had been kind of betrayed by the, by the city, by, the, by Milton Keynes, by the developer. And so Norman kind of decided that I was a good thing. Um, and we, I wrote about several other pieces for the same book. Um, and then about 10 years later, maybe a little, little bit more than that, I was the architecture editor at Fiden. And Norman and I were talking about a book. Um, and it involved um, meeting in Madrid for some reason. And on the way back, we talked about architecture books and you know, the future and all sorts of things. And Norman said, well, why don't you come and do it all with me? So I thought about it for a little while and thought actually it was an offered opportunity too good to turn down. And so I went to work in the Foster studio doing publications. Well, the studio was much smaller when I joined. It was something like, I think, even smaller than 500. And I remember people saying, oh, it's going to be a 1,000 before too long. And I thought, it's, it's unbelievably big. You know, I, didn't, I had no idea it would get beyond a 1,000. And the culture did change a lot, actually. But I was, in a sense, I was kind of impervious to it because you know, it was me and my little crew. And we did what we did. And we didn't really kind of have much involvement with the wider office other than use it as a resource. Yeah. We started with the Foster volumes. Well, there was a, the starting point, you have to understand, was um, Otto Leica's books, which it stopped at volume four. And they stopped only really because Otto died. And Norman didn't know what to do when Otto died. And he, uh, the volume four was done with somebody else. Um, and wasn't a success really. And so Norman was kind of at a point where he, he wanted to do something different, but he wasn't quite sure what it, was, what it should be. So we, we experimented. We had a sort of period of where we looked through options, which is a real typical kind of foster strategy. You know, you test and test and test until you find something that works. So for about a year, we kind of didn't actually produce anything that, that we used, but we just kind of played with material and, and kind of found a position where we felt comfortable. No, I never met Otto. He he died long before I got to, got involved with the office. But his memory was very, you know, the, the the kind of collective memory of Otto was very strong, and he was definitely a kind of kind of one of the ghosts in the room when we were working on the books. And we were constantly kind of thinking, is this better than Otto? Is it is it worse than Otto? What would Otto say? Um, so he was a kind of he was a kind of invisible guide in a way. Well, I mean, architectural photography has always been a kind of grey area, you know, because I mean, particularly in the age of retouching, we, I mean, we were as guilty as that, guilty of that as anybody. We, we, you know, took out dodgy bits in photographs and retouched a lot of things. Um, but the architectural photographer is, is, you know, is always interesting as, as a kind of way of seeing a building. You know, different photographers have different viewpoints. So the photographer, the architectural photographer, is a very important influence and and uh, filter. I'm not a fan of renderings. I mean, in the books we tried never to use them. They're too clean, they're too tidy, they're too pure. The, light, the light's always wrong, you know, the, the sky's always too blue. They don't, they, they, they don't convince somehow. I mean, I think it's, my own view is that it's kind of dying as an art, as a, as a discipline. I mean, when I, when I started out as a, as on the Architects Journal in the 80s, all the, all the editors were architects. They'd all trained as architects. They all understood architecture. So I think as a, as a, you know, as a pure discipline, architectural criticism is, is kind of withering, actually. Or oh, the Sainsbury Centre. Well, I went to see that building when I was a student in the 70s, just after it opened. And I was absolutely captivated by it. The light, the, t the technology, the space, the kind of generosity of it, the beauty of the detailing, the kind of clarity of the idea the kind of way it sat in the landscape, everything. I mean, it's just pure and enchanting. I mean, it's been compromised, of course, over the years. But because I saw it when I did, at a point in my career, when, you know, when I was still kind of very, when I was kind of looking for the kind of inspiration, I, I, it's still my favorite. Well, Norman's, you know, a, a one-off, really. 
You know, there are very few people that have had that kind of career trajectory. You know, from working class lad to, you know, architectural hero, in a sense. I mean, it's a kind of, um, it's, it's one of those, you know, if you read it as a kind of American success story, you think it was exaggerated. Um, and Norman is very, you know, he's very grounded. There's no, there's no nonsense about Norman. You know, lots of architects, when they get to a certain point in their careers, start to believe their own PR. You know, Norman is very, very sort of solid, very, very well grounded. And I respect him hugely.